When something like this happens, you just know you got a good fight on your hands. They start to fatigue and back to work on the jab. Oh. The fight between Petr Jan and Corey Sanhagen was a giant fan favorite fight because of the unique skills that these two fighters brought to the table. There's a lot more to this story than the chaotic exchanges that you just witnessed. Within the heart of this fight lies important lessons of combat to learn from along with a technical story that's going to resonate with you. When Petr Jan, a fighter known for his ruthless onslaught, took on Corey Sanhagen, these two fighters were sure to produce an action-packed war. The best part is that these two fighters are incredible technicians, so when they fought, a high-level match took place. We got to see an amazing display of fight IQ, and we learned a lot more about the tactics they used. But what exactly did we learn? Coming into this fight as a shorter fighter, Petagon had a tremendous challenge on his hands with Corey Sanhagen and what he had to offer. Corey stands about 5'11 and has slightly longer reach, and his fighting style is even harder to deal with due to his physical advantages. When this fight was laid out, there were some serious questions left on our mind about how things would play out, like the fact that Jan often depends heavily on his guard, and Corey also thrives on picking opponent's guard at range using his signature feeler jab. There's also the question if Jan could land his signature lead hook counter on Corey despite Corey's mastery of range. There was so much to wonder about in this fight. The more concerning part is that Corey's striking style indicated that his skills were a dangerous fit against Jan's very specific habits. All these questions played out and I'm about to reveal to you just how it went down. In my previous breakdown of Petr Jan's tactics, we took some time to take a look at how his style would clash with Corey's, and we'll be bridging some of those concepts here today to expand on what the story was. In this video, we'll be exploring their signature tactics and explaining why things play out the way they did, because this was a really fascinating technical back and forth filled with high level challenges. You're going to want to stay tuned because you're going to find out the brilliant reason why Jan was able to overcome the reach, and I'll explain the incredible footwork used by both of these fighters. Let's get started. To explain how a Petra Jan's fight typically plays out, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that Jan is pretty patient when it comes to approaching, but he's very persistent. In my previous work, I mentioned that his approach is partially built off of the fact that he waits for what the opponent feeds him in order to respond, and for this reason, it could take him a little while to find his rhythm, but he does catch up real quick. This is why you would see Jan seemingly catch up very rapidly as the fight progresses. Against Jose Aldo and Aljamain Sterling, they were able to implement their striking in ways that gave Jan a very difficult time, but he easily got the reads to punish them as the fight went on. Jan is not always consistent with outputting constant offense, but at the times that he chooses to attack, they always seem to be meaningful attacks that really count for a lot. When Sterling was able to pick at his guard and use various kicks to strike in volume, it only took Jan a very patient approach of a well-placed power shot to win him a round. And this is the dangerous aspect of Jan, his guard work and his deceptive understanding of when to attack at times that you least suspect is very dangerous. It's really interesting because the fight with Corey Sanhagen followed a similar story. Corey was the one to establish his rhythm and what he wanted to do. He imposed his range, he set up his footwork, and he kept the same pace throughout the match, but little by little, every attribute that made Corey so hard to handle would be met with merciless answers from Petr Jan. Make no mistake though, what Corey did was pretty impressive and praiseworthy. In my previous breakdown of DJ Dillashaw vs Corey Sanhagen, I went over three of his main signature moves in detail to show how he utilizes his flying knee, his feeler jab, and his body shots. If these attacks are something that favors your style, you absolutely want to pay attention to Corey because he almost always manages to land these tactics against high level fighters out there in the division. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check out the video of his signature moves, but I will summarize the main concepts here. Corey was able to establish his range as soon as the fight started. He typically uses his filler jab on opponents to set up his other attacks. He always makes sure not to overcommit his shots to ensure the opponent has little time to counter him. This is why you would see TJ have such a hard time countering Corey with his own lead hook counter. Corey would usually use his feeler jab to read what the opponent does, and he tries to exploit those habits. When he saw TJ slipping off of the feeler jab, 
he would use the filler jab to set up something like a head kick to exploit that habit. Against Yan, this high IQ play happened the same way, since Yan typically liked to hunch over to create his super tight defense, makes him very susceptible to combos, and we've seen fighters use their jab to draw Yan into his guard in order to land things like knees in order to punish his reactions. Cordy did the same thing, using the jab to draw Yan into guarding and then punishing him with knees as well. I also talked previously about Yan's defensive habit of slipping off to the side. This is a very specific thing that he does, and you can visit my previous video on Yan's signature fighting tactics if you want to know a little bit more about why he does this. But the main idea I want to highlight here is that when he slips off to the side, it makes him very vulnerable to flying knees. So Ling was actually able to catch Yan with a flying knee when he slipped off to the side doing this. Corey is able to use a flying knee as Yan would slip off to the side just as we speculated. With Corey punishing many people with a flying knee, it was actually really surprising that Yan managed to endure these attempts. Due to Yan's habit of heavily relying on the guard, this actually played really well into Corey's footwork. His offensive footwork was really interesting to see because it highlights one very big hindrance of relying on the guard. When you guard, you're typically fixed into one place to brace yourself for the shot, but if the opponent moves around your guard, you have to adjust your position to respond back appropriately. Corey took advantage of this extremely well early on. One of Corey's signature attacks was to throw his lead shot out, and then hit a lateral angle, and then punish from the other side. This is actually one of my favorite techniques to use, and I picked this up from TJ Dillashaw actually. This is something very similar to what he used to knock out Cody Garbrandt. By throwing his jab out, he would hit a lateral angle and then attack from that new side. TJ also has different variations of this technique as well. To explain how this works, you typically want to throw the lead hand out to distract the opponent. The lead hand isn't really necessarily meant to hurt the opponent, but you're basically using it to draw out some kind of specific reaction, and for Yan, Cory would throw it out and it would draw Yan into shelling up. When you draw that reaction, you're simultaneously hitting a new angle where they're gonna have a hard time attacking you. You can use this split window of time to attack where they're forced to adjust to your new angle. Okay, so notice that as Cory's about to throw his shot, it's gonna prompt Yan to put his guard up and stay fixed into that position. And look at the blue aerial, he's gonna move out laterally outside of Yan's offensive angles. And you're gonna notice that Yan is gonna have to change his angles right here to adjust to the new position, but Cory can actually use his time frame to attack during this transition. As another example from in sparring, I'll flash my lead shot out and this causes the opponent to react, and then I'll attack from another angle. Likewise, you could actually use this to bail an attack like a kick or something, and then use a lateral switch to hit an angle outside and then punish from a new angle. This is one of the tactics that you'll probably see me drill from time to time at the end of my videos. I was really fascinated by Cory attacking using this footwork because I don't really recall Cory attacking in this way in his previous fight. I found this footwork interesting because this footwork is often used by TJ Dillashaw, and it could foreshadow how TJ's footwork might possibly work against Petr Jan if they were ever to fight. Another signature move of Cory was to throw his cross, stand switch, and then exit out at a 45 degree angle away from the opponent. This was the tactic that he used against TJ, and the idea is that you want to come in to attack, switch your stance so that your feet were positioned to escape into a different angle. To illustrate this, watch as Cory throws his cross, he stance switches up, and this allows him to create an angle where in the blue aerial he can move 45 degrees back. Then he's gonna do it again, he's gonna throw his cross, stance switch. His feet are positioned to move in the blue arrow's direction and he exits at 45 degrees. Cory did this quite often against Yan and it showed to be pretty effective. This fundamentally follows the same principle that we discussed earlier. Due to Yan's habit of guarding, he gets planted and fixed into a stationary position and this allows Cory to attack and move around Yan at his own discretion. One more tactic I want to mention is Cory's head fake into a gazelle hook, then exiting off at an angle. It's pretty much similar to the lateral shift I showed you earlier, but in this situation, Cory would dip his head slightly to fake a shot, then he would throw his gazelle hook and then actually exit off at a lateral angle into more defensive position. And here, Cory's gonna head fake, throw that lead hook, that guard gets up, and then Cory's gonna hit a lateral angle outside of Yan's power angle. And you notice that Yan's gonna have to change his angles because he's not in a good position to attack. This is the perfect time for Cory to attack while Yan has to transition to turnover. The last tactic to show is Cory's habit of throwing his cross and then hop stepping off at an angle. This allows him to attack and then fade into more defensive position where he can stay out of danger after attacking. 
This happens to be a signature tactic, very similar to what fighters like Eddie Alvarez and Dominic Cruz will do. If it isn't Quarry probing his jab to set up his strikes or using his footwork to set up his offense, he also sets up a lot of his signature body shot setups. He works to get Jan into guarding in order to punish his body and he's done this multiple times in the fight. As the fight went on, even though Corey had some really nice moments of work in the body, Jan would actually counter his signature body shots with his own signature counter, the lead hook, and this was done on multiple occasions. As a matter of fact, this is the straw that broke the camel's back in the sequence when Jan countered with the lead hook and did this kind of Mortal Kombat combo spinning back this hook. Here Jan is going to step back, throw his signature lead hook counter from his guard, then do a step across and then end up doing a spinning back fist ending with a power shot, sending Corey to the ground. This was a huge turning point in the fight from what I was able to observe because it made Corey far more cautious about going for the body again after taking such a devastating blow. This was crucial because Jan was able to mitigate Corey from using his signature body shot moving forward. You know what's really amusing is that this setup is actually something very similar to how he landed his own spinning back fist on TJ Dillashaw. So if you watch here, Corey's gonna throw his lead hook and then he'll do a step across and then set up his spinning back fist. Very similar here, he's gonna throw that lead hook, step across, and then do a spinning back fist, but with a power shot. Jan's spinning back fist hook appeared to be one of the signature attacks that he would typically go to many times throughout this fight. This part of the breakdown is going to be really useful, especially if you want to understand how the shorter fighter must handle the longer range opponents. Jan had to deal with multiple dimensions of difficulty due to Koi's long range approach. Koi would constantly circle out out of range and then he would also constantly attack and probe with that jab at his long range where he could touch Jan and Jan couldn't really touch him. However, Jan showed some brilliant IQ moves and having answers for every puzzle that was thrown in front of him. For example, when Koi would circle away and evade, one of the useful strategies Yan would do is move carefully in with his tight guard to cut Koi off towards the end of the cage. This meant that Koi could not move back, but he could only move side to side. Yan would move to one side to cover one space, then he would throw his kicks to the other side to punish Koi circling off of the cage. When Cory would probe out those jabs, Jan would handle some of this by occasionally hand fighting with him in order to breach Cory's long arms. Now to recap how this works, for the guests of our channel who aren't quite familiar with this yet, Jan will control and occupy the lead hand in order to keep that threat in check and then breach the distance to land his own shots. Now controlling the lead hand ensures that you have one less threat to worry about and this allows you to advance forward. Now this tactic was something that I previously talked about as well and I showed how he was able to use this against Jose Aldo multiple times when they engaged in hand fighting. And sure enough, against Corey, Jan was able to land a lot of meaningful shots by controlling Corey's lead hand. Even when Corey did manage to probe the jab at Jan's guard, Jan didn't let him get away with it that easily. He would have some good answers for this throughout the fight. If Corey managed to hit Jan's guard from his long punching range, Jan couldn't easily punch back, but he could attack in range by throwing his kicks. You would see him throw a lot of kicks often when Corey would poke the jab out. Even if Jan couldn't really reach from the punching range, his kicks would allow him to strike from the kicking range. Another useful strategy I saw was that Jan would occasionally slam the leg kicks when Corey would probe out that jab. He didn't quite do this as much, but the leg kicks are a very nice natural counter to the jab since the opponent can't really easily defend the kicks at the step forward to jab or probe the jab. TJ's use of leg kicks to mitigate Corey's jab actually proved to be a pretty useful strategy as well. This is actually really important because Corey heavily relies on probing his jab filler out, so using kicks is a good way to handle this. Ideally, longer fighters like to strike where they can hit you, but you can't really hit them. And this means that if you were to counter punch, you would have to counter punch by simultaneously closing that gap in order to strike in range. When Yan wanted to attack or counter back, he actually made some really good adjustments to make up for the distance that Corey was striking at. Early on, Yan had a lot of troubles initially trying to land his lead hook counter, but later on he would adjust and then actually land his counters by hop stepping with his counter. So here you see Yan throw his counter punch but also simultaneously hop step closer into range and then follows up with his strikes. Note how with the hop step, this allows Yan to close this much more distance. The hop step is very minor, but he doesn't really lift his feet off the ground too far, so it actually lets him transition pretty fast to close that distance. 
When going on the attack, he'll actually do the same thing by hop-stepping fist jab to close that distance and then firing his power shot. And again, you're gonna see that minor hop-step is just enough to bring him right inside the range. So keep in mind against a longer range matchups, one way to counter strike or attack the opponent is by hop stepping with your strike to make up for that range. However, another alternative way is to also time your counters as they commit forward. Now this is very strict on timing, but if you could land it with the right timing right before they retreat, you'll be able to land your shots just how Jan was able to do throughout the fight. Another useful habit of Jan was to shift up with his punches in order to close that distance. He had to do this multiple times, but it did allow him to close that distance on Corey. This kind of highlights how important it is to strike on the move, especially in the MMA where the landscape is pretty big and fighters are a little bit more inclined to be more mobile. I found because of Jan's tight guard and his very careful pressure tendencies of coming in, Corey's stance switching wasn't too much of an issue in this fight. In fact, his corner actually told him to punish his stance switching by kicking the legs. So there were some moments where he was able to do that, although I didn't see a lot of consistency with this. There's one more characteristic about Jan that makes him very dangerous. His sense of rhythm is incredibly deceptive, yet effective. When it comes to rhythm, his sense of timing shots on opponents when they least expect it is just on another level. This is why Petr Jan can land the most basic striking techniques using high level timing. For this fight, there were two main ways that he was able to deceptively time his shots. The first method is his signature tactic that I covered in previous videos, but for a new guest, again, on this channel, I'll recap the concept a little bit here. And to show you how it works, I'll be playing a clip from my previous breakdown to explain how it works. When you use your guard and you put your guard up, it tells the opponent that you're going to enter a defensive state. This can actually draw the opponent to come to attack you. You can use this against them by purposely pretending you're going to enter defense, but quickly change your rhythm into an attack as they come forward. For example, watch these instances. You're going to see that Jan will put his guard up for a split second, then he'll quickly burst to land something like a cross or a combo. Now the shots that tend to hurt you the most tend to be the ones that you don't really see coming. When Jan conveys that he's entering defense, it kind of diminishes the opponent's defensive senses because they're either relaxed or they're moving forward into Jan's power because they're likely to feel like Jan isn't really attacking them. So now that we have that out of the way, you're going to notice that when Jan does put his guard up, as soon as he does that, he almost immediately changes the tempo to attack when Koi's defensive senses have relaxed after seeing Jan has entered a defensive posture. Yan has a really good sense of rhythm when it comes to attacking fighters when they're adjusting. Throughout the fight, he would actually time his advancements in the very moments when Corey would be mid-transition in his stance switching or adjusting his stance. Yan would press forward in the most abrupt rhythm to catch Corey even before his feet were set. Attack with the foot not even grounded yet. Same thing, Corey gets attacked when the foot isn't even grounded. The story of this fight came down to so many different IQ plays. It was a back and forth display, but it quickly turned into a typical Petra Jan story, where he patiently took his time establishing what exactly he wanted to punish, and then he did not let off once which he figured out how to solve a certain puzzle. We saw this in how he would close distance and use his hop set to close range, or even counter Corey as he circled off against the cage. The coolest part about this fight had to be the fact that both fighters had the perfect tools for punishing each other's very own specific habits. Like when we saw Corey set up the flying knee to exploit Jan's habit of shelling off and slipping. But we also saw how Jan's signature counter hook played extremely well into Corey's signature body shots. The fight between Petr Jan and Koi Sandhagen gets my personal seal of approval in terms of a match that you would actually want to go back to study because it's filled with so many useful lessons that you could learn from, like handling range or the use of good footwork shown by both of these fighters. There's a lot more that could be explored in this fight, but I don't want to make this video too long, so I'll just leave it as it is right now. I just want to reiterate again to consider joining my newsletter on my website for updates and the things that I'll be working on. Some of the content that I'll be working on will be exclusive to my website, but you can get updates by joining the newsletter. I'll be working on some exclusive content for my website now that I finally have the video complete. I should be back on schedule now after this fight.
I still intend to make a video about Petrojan tactics that I didn't really get to cover in the past few videos, and I'll post that on my site too so you can get access to that site. I'm also going to talk about a few things that Koi did too, like for example explaining why he might throw a probe out like this, where it doesn't even look like he's even trying to hit Yan. I'm going to cover a few of those kind of details and small things like that on my website exclusively, so please go check that out. Okay, thanks for watching everybody, keep on training and then stay tuned for next time. I'm very glad that I can be part of your journey in this martial arts world. Hopefully I've earned your subscription today. Have a good one.